What's up, everybody? In this video, I want to walk you through some of the ways that I'm using saturation in sound design and mixing of bass heavy electronic music. I have a song spooled up here that I'll use to demo some of these principles. It's a loud drum and bass song that I co-produced with the Warp Academy sound design team. Let's start off by just giving it a listen through to the end of the first drop. Right on. So the reason I brought the limiter up so you guys could see it is so that you can see how little the limiter is working to be able to get this song loud. Uh, I have mastered this in a different project. I exported the stereo uh, bus and I mastered it actually to negative six luffs in the drop. It's very loud. It's not as loud as some drum and bass goes, but it is very loud. But I wanted to see you how little the limiter was sweating or getting pushed to be able to get it that loud. And one of the reasons why the limiter is just getting tickled is because I've used saturation and clipping all throughout my mix. And so in this video, I'm really gonna focus in on saturation though. And we're gonna explore the new Ableton Live 12 saturation device. Well, it's much more than a saturation device, but let's just put it in a box for now called Roar. And I'm going to take some of the ways that I've done saturation in this mix and recreate them, reimagine them using Roar. So. Let's begin the discussion around saturation and mixing with uh, a quick um, a quick tangent around where do you use saturation in a mix? The absolute last place that I use saturation is on the master because of intermodulation. And if you don't understand intermodulation, then you need to go and watch uh, David Nazi Mix Bus TV video. And I will link it below this one because he shows and explains how intermodulation works you will get some indifference partials by pushing sound into a, a complex signal like a bus or a master into any saturation device. And in general, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound clean. You get uh, these some indifference partials that are non-musical. And uh, usually I try and avoid that at all costs. So the first place that I will saturate is on an individual sound track by track level. The next place I'll saturate is on my submixes. And just so you can quickly see my submixing structure, you can see I have a set of these submixes. I'm not going to go into detail on these because this would be its own deep dive uh, into my submixes, but I do have this template available uh, for free on Warp Academy, and I update it from time to time. This is called my Lightspeed Mixing Template, and this is this submixing structure is really key to my workflow and how I'm able to work quickly and cleanly. But uh, the reason I mention it is because the next place I would use saturation is on one of these buses like my sub and bass bus, right? I would use it first on the individual bass instruments and sounds and tracks, and then I would next use it on the sub and bass or for example, the all drums bus. And at the, the last place and the place that I would use it most judiciously and most carefully is on my master, okay? So I'm the most heavy handed using saturation on the individual sounds and then I get lighter and lighter as I touch things that are more complex summing points in the mix. Okay, so with that said, let's uh, let's take a look at this mix and uh, I wanna hone in on one of those individual sounds because that would, like I said, be my first place to start with saturation. So let's fire off the drop. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, just solo up the basses. And in this case, the way the sound design has been approached, all of this sound design was done using Serum 
because this is one of the demo songs from a sound bank that uh, myself and our team created in Serum. So these are all Serum presets from our Dark Side Funk sound bank. And uh, they've been rendered to audio, as you would. And uh, so we didn't use a separate sub as you could in some approaches. All the sub is actually coming from the individual bass patches. So this is all the bass running through one single group. Okay, so I want to hone in on this one particular bass sound called Depolarize, because it's really carrying the tune at this point. Okay, now that you've heard that on its own, let's, let, let's listen in context. Yeah, it is what I would consider the main downbeat bass. And this is kind of how it started off. This is, this is how it sounded. And I felt like it was a little bit too up the center for me, and I wanted to add a bit of stereo embellishment to it. So we're not into roar yet. I'm going to show you how I was doing this. So I created a audio effect rack and I called it stereo distortion. And if we look inside of it, you can see what I'm doing. I have these chains and there's an LFO modulator on each chain. And that LFO modulator is mapped out to a saturator. So I have two saturators. They're hard panned left and right. Okay. And you can see each one of the saturators is using the wave shaper. And then you can see from the green dots uh, what's being uh, macroed. And you can see um, that it is macroing the, um, this parameter right here. Okay, So we're, we're getting the wave shaper uh, tilting back and forth. And that's corresponding to this sine wave. And then we have this sine wave doing the same thing, but uh, in a different way. And because these are hard panned, these create a very wide stereo image. Now it is possible to go too wide and that's why I put this in parallel. So I used a macro that's mapped out to the wet dry parameter of the saturators so I can really uh, control this and curtail it a little bit. So let's let's listen to it maxed out, okay? It's, it's gonna be kind of crazy sounding. Yeah, not good on its own, but when you tuck that in and, and you just nudge this in, in uh, parallel using the wet dry, um, it sounds pretty nice. Okay, subtle-ish, but I really like ways of adding stereo field to a base without destroying the center of the image, and that's what this is doing. So let's go ahead and turn this off, and I want to explore what can be done with the new Roar device. So let's grab that under audio effects. And uh, this is a totally different ball game to the saturator, right? The saturator is a very useful, but very simplistic device. The first thing that I will always do in any saturation device is enable oversampling uh, because I, I'm a, not a huge fan of oversampling in some devices. If you've seen any of my videos on YouTube, I actually speak out against oversampling a lot. Um, just blindly using oversampling for many reasons that we don't need to digress into here. But with this plugin, this is a saturation plugin. I'm using this, I'm going to use this to dig in to the RMS of the signal. This is going to be producing sustained harmonics. And whenever you produce sustained harmonics that go up the harmonic series and extend uh, and hit Nyquist, those are going to be reflected back into the audible spectrum as aliasing or aliasing distortion, right? So, uh, I don't see any reason why you would ever want to use one of these without oversampling on unless you were really trying to save CPU. But I, I've never run into CPU issues from using oversampling and saturators. So let's uh, let's cover that. So right click, enable high quality. And in general, what I do with these devices is I will also go save as default preset once I do that. So anytime I load a roar, it loads with high quality, which is just oversampling enabled okay so that's going to help to curtail or prevent aliasing in the plugin as we push harmonics okay so that's the first step now let's just uh let's let's play with this I, it has a bunch of these neat routing options okay 
Um, I'm not going to go exhaustively into everything that these are. This is not an exhaustive tutorial on Roar. I'm just going to show you how I use it in this song, okay? So uh, I'm going to leave it on single for now. You can go in parallel. You can go multiband. You can go midside. Uh, there's lots of neat modes there that I would use in different scenarios. But for now, let's let's just crank this up and listen to it on our bass. Okay, now the very next tip that I have for you on saturation or really any plugin that's adding processing, is you need to be making an apples to apples comparison of whether or not the processing is actually improving and, and providing you the effect that you want. It's very easy to fool your ears with loudness. And uh, anytime you have plugins that are adding gain or perceived loudness, you need to compensate for that and compensate for that so that you are hearing the same or as close as possible to the same perceived loudness with it, with the effect on and with the effect off, right? And this is what any mastering or, or mix engineer would do with every device meticulously along. So the way that I do this is I use a peak level meter. In this case, I'm using levels from mastering the mix. And I, I take a look at peak level before. So we're hitting negative 2.1. We turn roar on, right? It's, uh, it's definitely producing a jump. And in terms of how much level increase is noticeable, that's what's called the JND, the Just Noticeable Difference in Research. And there's an Audio Engineering Society paper on the JND around loudness. And it depends on, you can fool your ears with as little as 0.2 dB of a, of a level jump. Okay, so that's why I'm doing this. Um, I'm going to dial in the saturator first, but I am, you're going to see me looking at this peak meter. And when I get it dialed in, I'm going to adjust the output of the chain to compensate so that it matches the input. And so I get as close to the same perceived loudness uh, without and with the effect. Okay, so uh, for now we can put levels away and let's just uh, dial it in, get the sound we're looking for, figure out what we wanna do here. Let's play with some of the algorithms. This is soft. Let's, let's see what else we got here. Digital clip. That's nasty. Diode clipper. Ooh. Yeah, like that. Tube's nice. Rectifier. See, we lose all the low end in that, so to me, I'm like, I would have to blend that in in parallel. We want low end. Polynomial. That's pretty neat. Fractal. Yeah, some of these are, are really interesting. Well, they're all interesting. I'm just listening for a particular timbre noise injection. Yeah, interesting. And shards. Yeah, it looks like some crazy modulated jitter that's happening there. Really neat. Okay, so the ones that I liked are, are shards. And then I, I kind of liked the polynomial and I liked the tube. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is kind of dial it into taste. And I want to recreate what I was doing in the saturator stereo distortion that I had done. I want to get a wide stereo image, right? So let's go ahead and, uh, and just kind of get this set up. Okay. And then I'm going to uh, rack this. That's pretty much the first thing I do when I start working with effects. So uh, I can just right click and I can go group or you can go command or control G for that one. So I'm going to rack it. Okay. And we'll expose our chains and uh, I'm going to do that hard pan trick. So I'm going to take this and go roar right. And then we can duplicate that command D and roar left. Okay. So now we have two chains. And uh, let's go ahead and change. So we got shards on one, and let's go ahead and change to the tube preamp on the other. Now let's listen to what we have. Now there's a huge level increase there. So, so now it's time to compensate for that. And uh, let's go ahead and expose the macros. And I want to macro the output. So I want the output of both of these to be assigned to macro one, right click, map to macro one. Okay. And then uh, we can go map, 
right click map to all siblings. So that means that this is a sibling and it means that as I turn this macro down now, both of them are going to output down, gain stage down the same amount. That is very, very useful when you have multiple chains going on. Okay, so let's actually get a quantify how much this is uh, adding level, okay? Yeah, so we need, uh, we definitely need to gain stage that down a bit. That's in the ballpark. Okay, thanks levels. Okay, now the next thing that I wanna do is uh, I almost never go full beans on the wet dry, right? So the next thing I'm gonna wanna do is right click. We go map to macro two. We will go map to all siblings. And let's put this in parallel. 50% uh, is a good starting point. We're gonna let some of the dry signal bleed through. And in general, there's another principle with saturation that I wanna share with you. It's that I like stacking saturation in layers, but always letting some of the, or almost always letting some of the dry signal bleed through. So when you get a clean signal and you put a little bit of harmonics on it, rather than pushing one saturator really hard, it's nice to do layers of saturation. I find it's warmer that way. Maybe that's one of the reasons I like it. But you're, the next stage of saturation is saturating the previous stage. And I should mention that that is actually something that can be done in ROAR. So you can go from single to serial and you get stage one, stage two. So this function is kind of like how uh, Isotope Trash 2 does. I always liked how it had the multiple stages. So if you want to get really crazy with your tone shaping, you can go into serial and, uh, and you can go like that. In this case, I'm not trying to push this bass too much in one stage. So I'm just going to leave it in single. Okay, so where are we at? Let's, let's listen in the mix. It's always good not to get too dialed in in solo. We want to listen in context. Okay, I like that. So the other thing I might want to experiment with a little bit, um, and, and Roar is awesome because, check this out. Whoa, love that, right? That's uh, so nice to have a little bit extra real estate to work with as you're, as you're fussing with parameters and things like that. So that's actually really neat. You can you really fine tune the different uh, um, type of saturation in, in each one of the areas of the of the device here so it's nice to be able to access that and uh, you can even see some of the mod sources and and things like that because this has modulation in it so uh, that might be something neat we can expand this area right here and we see mod sources and a mod matrix so you can see we have uh, lfos we have lfo to lfos we have an envelope follower we have a noise oscillator and uh, it might be neat here to experiment with how modulation could uh, could work a little bit for us so uh, the way you would assign modulation, and again, uh, we're keeping in mind that this is going to be stereo. We want this to be stereo. So I want different modulation, likely, on the left side from the right side. Okay, so uh, let's start off with the roar on the left that we were just on. And to take the uh, LFO here, maybe take the rate up a little bit to a quarter note or so. I love this morph parameter. Um, it, uh, it can change the uh, the LFO a little bit. We can go free and uh, yeah, see what that does there. It uh, just kind of bends the LFO shape so it's not just a, a uh, straight up sine wave. So now we go to the matrix. How do we assign? It's always fun to learn how to assign things, modulators to destinations. So LFO one, go to the matrix. Um, what might we want to play with? Well, let, let's just manually play with a knob here, okay? Tone, tone could be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe maybe we want to assign a modulator to tone. We click tone. You can see tone amount populates into the target, and then we can control the amount of modulation to tone that's going in there. Nice. 
So now let's go to Roar on the right-hand side. We'll open up the modulator area and uh, let's go ahead and choose the sine wave. We'll choose a different rate. So we were on a quarter note. Maybe we go, we have go synced, triplet, dotted. So we've got lots of, uh, lots of parameters here. And let's go to the matrix. We'll click tone and let's go ahead and add some modulation there as well. And it'll be different modulation. Okay, so one of the things you have to be careful of with this is that you don't go too nuts on the stereo in the bottom end of the spectrum, right? So it's okay to do it in the mids and the tops, but if you want the bottom end of your song or your song in general to correlate and to sound good on mono subs, you are going to need to have some information right up the center in the bottom end of your main bass patches. So we can click on the stereo field area. We can see how wide this is. This plugin is kind of neat because it turns red if it gives you a flag on something. But to me, that's that's taking the center a little bit out of the out of the bottom end. And so uh, let's address that. So uh, Roar gives us this multiband mode, which is awesome for that. So we're going to take it from single to multiband. It splits it into low, mid, high. Um, we have the crossover points right here, 200 and 2K. Uh, I'm not going to fuss with those. Those are all good. And you can look and we can click and see the different areas we can turn them on or off so they can, act, they can actually function like an EQ, which is kind of neat. Uh, but we're going to leave them all active. And if you just click on the tab, you can see you have settings for each one. Now, it hasn't taken my settings from the low band, right? So what you can do here is you can right click on this and you can go copy all settings from stage one. Now it has even the modulation. That's cool. Copy all settings from stage one. And then we can take on the low band, the amount down to zero. So we're effectively cutting the saturation off of the reducing or eliminating the saturation off of the low band, but to below 200. And uh, we can do the same thing. We take roar on the left, we go to multiband, and we can go copy from stage one, copy from stage one. Right, there we go. Looking good. And then we can take the amount on the low band down to zero. Let's see how that sounds. Nice. So let's check that out in the mix now. Right on. Well, there you have it. There's a little bit of uh, old school Ableton Live flavor in there with the stereo distortion on the saturator. A few old tricks that uh, work in the audio effect rack to be able to copy things to siblings and map to macros. And then a whole bag of new sound design and mixing possibilities available for you via Roar. I've only really scratched the surface with this device. It's so much more than just a saturation unit. Uh, and I'm really really amped actually to to dig deeper into it, to put it through its paces, to try all of these different modes and and really learn it on a deeper level and put it to use in my projects. I hope this was really useful for you. If you enjoyed this one, please give the video a thumbs up. You can drop me a comment. Let me know what you thought about this one. If you have any questions about this or any, any requests for future content from me, I hope that you will use some of these tips and you've uh, are able to implement them in your music and uh, really get psyched with saturation. Thanks for joining me. And I'll catch you again soon. Take care.